Uh, we're at the kickoff breakfast in 2020. Please turn off your cell phones. Mine's turned off. Don't keep calling it just to test me. Um, and I'd like to take time to thank the Community Media Center as they are filming today's event. Uh, it's going to be great to get that out to the community in addition to the people who were uh, so good as to attend today. Uh, the Carroll County Chamber of Commerce has approximately 600 business members and we've been building relationships since 1924. Relationships drive business. Today we shine a spotlight on another type of relationship we seek to strengthen and grow. The relationship between our business community and our elected officials who are part of the Carroll County delegation to the Maryland General Assembly in Annapolis. Uh, the Maryland General Assembly meets uh, from January 8th to April 6th to act on more than 2,500 bills, including the state's budget. The Legislative Committee of the Chamber has a long tradition of reviewing proposed legislation and taking a pro-business stand by writing letters to our delegation and the chairs of the various committees in uh, the Senate and the House in Annapolis. They review our letters and are your voice to be heard by and through the Chamber. This is one of the biggest and most little known benefits that the Chamber provides to our community and to the entire local business community. Last year, we wrote over 100 letters advocating for business interests in Carroll County and the state of Maryland. Our letters, uh, of the letters we wrote last year, 43% of them were decided according to pro-business positions. If you're a member of the legis Legislative Committee, please stand up and be recognized. If you are not a member of this Legislative Committee and you would like to be a member of this Legislative Committee, please talk to Mike McMullen. We start meeting weekly on Mondays beginning January 20th through the end of March and we'd love to have more input. Uh, I'm going to go through a bunch of folks here that we want to recognize. I'm going to try to hold applause to the end so we get out on time. So uh, I'm going to start with the members of the Carroll County delegation. Please stand and be recognized. Senator Justin Reedy. Uh, Delegate Susan Krebs, Delegate April Rose, Delegate Haven Shoemaker, uh, Delegate Trent Kittleman, uh, Delegate Dan Cox was supposed to be there today, but he is uh, experiencing a family emergency. His father's in hospice, so Sally Taylor from his office was good enough to come, I believe. Thank you. Uh, and then we have Carroll County Commissioners who showed up today. We've got uh, Mr. Steve Wance, President of the Board. Uh, Ed Rothstein, Vice President of the Board. Uh, Rich, uh, Richard Weaver, I don't think he could make it. Nope. Uh, Dennis Frazier. And then uh, we've got other elected officials that are good enough to make it here today. Uh, Carroll County State's Attorney Brian DiLeonardo. Uh, Carroll County Sheriff Jim DeWeese. Uh, Carroll County Superintendent of Schools, uh, Dr. Stephen Lockard. And then uh, we have members of the Board of Education, uh, Tara Battaglia, uh, Marsha Herbert, uh, Patricia Dorsey, Kenneth Kyler, and uh, we have Westminster City Council persons, Ben Yingling and Ann Gilbert. Uh, Tawny Town City Council member Diane Foster. Uh, we'd also like to recommend the, uh, recognize the president of Carroll Community College, Dr. James Ball. Uh, former Tawny Town Mayor Jim McCarran. And again, to recognize Mr. Uh, Bill Gavin, who has done this for, done this for so long previously. Is there anyone that I miss that's an elected official? Let's let's get a round of applause for everybody. Thank you. We'd also like to uh, recognize all the folks who made such great contributions to this organization and been the past uh, chair of the Chamber's Board of Directors. Uh, Ellen Finnerty Myers, standing up already. Wayne Barnes, it's all Wayne, there's Wayne. Uh, Dave Bollinger, Steve Aquino, Ben Yingling again, got twice. Suzette Colvat. Did I miss any one of those? All right, give a round of applause for all those past kids. We'll now hear from our sponsors, uh, BGE, Comcast, and Carroll Hospital. Then we'll turn over the program to our moderator, Dana Blum, chair of our legislative committee, and Dana will act as a moderator. Uh, BGE is a longtime sponsor of this event. They've been sponsoring this event, perhaps, 
towards the start of that 50 years, we don't know, but it's been a long time. And uh, today, uh, Megan Eves, external affairs manager for BGE, is here to say a few words. Thank you. Yeah. Good morning and happy new year. I'll keep my remarks short and sweet as pipes and wires aren't that exciting, and I know we're, we're looking forward to hearing about what's in store for the next 90 days. I would like to share a few things from last year that reinforced BG's um, commitment to the community. Last month, we celebrated recipients of BG's third annual Bright Idea Teacher Grants, which supports STEM in the classroom. I'm happy to share we honored six Carroll County Public School teachers, five from Francis Guy Key and one from Runnymede Elementary School, where they'll be able to replace projectors and also add laptops. Another grant opportunity where BG is now accepting applications is for our Emergency Response and Safety Grants Program. Applications are available online at bg.com and must be submitted by January 15th. Please don't hesitate to reach out if you have questions. And with that, Dennis, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. All right, thank you, Megan. Uh, our next sponsor is Comcast, and during their message is Rachel Buckley. Uh, she is going to come up right now. Yeah, Rachel, welcome. Good morning, everyone, and Happy New Year. Um, on behalf of Comcast, I just want to say thank you for allowing us the opportunity to sponsor this breakfast this morning. This is a great way to kick off 2020. Um, you know, we've come a very long way since our inception in the 1960s um, when we referred to ourselves as just a cable company. We're obviously a lot more than that today. Um, and we like to call ourselves more of a technology company. So, um, you know, just thinking back how things have changed over the past 10 years, we've launched two really great products um, to add to our suite of services with our Xfinity Home product, as well as our most recently Xfinity Mobile product. Um, we've also been continuing to upgrade our internet speeds, as well as upgrading our X1 platform, which comes with our very popular voice remote, which some of you may have, um, allowing customers the opportunity to really um, stream more content, um, as we see that's kind of where the direction is headed. So um, I look forward to, to see what's to come in the next 10 years. I'm sure we'll have a lot to talk about and look forward to just continuing to build the relationships and partnerships that we've made here with the Carroll County Chamber. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Our final sponsor is Carroll Hospital. We'll hear from Stephanie Morrow, Carroll Hospital Foundation Gift Officer. far from the mic, so hopefully you can hear me. Um, good morning and happy new year, um, 2020 already. It's crazy that it's come so quick. My name is Stephanie, I'm with Carroll Hospital Foundation. Um, just some quick information on this hospital for those of you that aren't quite familiar. Um, we're not just this hospital, we actually are also Carroll Hospice in our dub house across the street here. Um, we support Access Carroll, which is down the street, um, which gives um, healthcare to low risk or, uh, or at risk um, families. Um, we are also Carroll Health group, which is a group of providers in Carroll County, not just Westminster. Um, and we're also LifeBridge, which consists of Sinai, Levendale, Northwest, and currently Grace Medical, which used to be Bon Secours in Baltimore. Um, today, we have about 170 inpatient um, and here in the hospital, and we have about 240 in our community and hospice care. And that includes um, our Dove House across the street, which now is about eight. Um, and we are at capacity there, and we are looking to expand here in the next couple months. Um, we actually have some people here in the hospital um, that need to move over, but we don't have room. So we are um, on the verge of expanding and making that better for our community. Um, you'll also find a list of events at your um, table here. Um, that is everything we're doing in, the, in 2020. Um, we are very grateful for all of your support and hope that you can join us for our events. And we're also looking for volunteers. So if anybody is interested in volunteer, volunteering at the hospital, please let me know. Thank you and welcome to Carol. Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you to all of our amazing sponsors. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, Dana now. She was Dana Blum is the person who's going to be moderating everything here. She is the uh, chair of the Chamber Legislative Committee. She's a certified human resources professional, a past president of the Governmental Affairs Director of Carroll County Chapter of the Society of Human Resource Management. She's currently serving in an HR uh, special needs project for Chains, Inc. 
Dana has more than 25 years' experience as an HR professional across a broad range of industries, including engineering, manufacturing, nonprofit, and television. And Dana has served as the Chamber's Legislative Care. She has served on the committee for the Legislative Affairs Committee for over 10 years. Please, please join me in welcoming our moderator, Ms. Dana Blum. Morning. Thank you, Dennis, and uh, Happy New Year. And if I could ask the, um, our delegation to come forward and take their seats, that would be great um, so that we can get started in a few minutes. <clears throat> what I would um, like to first say is thank you to Mike again, and thank you to Bill. I'm so glad to see him here this year. Uh, nice to see him. He's going to be on the committee, too. Oh, that's great. <laughs> Always use that support. So. What I would like to do is keep um, the opening comments from our delegation to about three to five minutes so that everybody can have a chance to speak. Um, and I would also ask you to speak from your chair via the microphone. The setup is a little bit awkward, so we don't want to keep jockeying back and forth. And then we want to leave time for questions from the audience. So if we're ready, I think we're going to start from my right with um, Delegate Kittleman, if you'd like to give um, basically, introduce yourself, your district, and what you think is the top issue for this year. Can I stand up? You certainly can. <laughs> we, we, we can only talk in the legislature if we stand up. So. <laughs> uh, good morning, good morning. Um, and thank you all for being here. I represent Sykesville. It's a, about a third of my district. I also have Howard County, which is where I live. Um, but every time I come to an event in Carroll, I thank you all because I just love this county. I love being in a room full of people who think the same way that I do primarily, business people in this case, who understand that the <clears throat> kinds of regulations that our legislature continuously passes really do have consequences, uh, maybe over time. But we've never been able to get that message across to the legislature. As you will hear from everybody on the panel, uh, this year is going to be, we, we, to tell you what's gonna happen over the next three months, you may know better than we do, but a brand new Speaker of the House, Adrienne Jones, I think she's gonna be a good speaker. We are going to have a brand new President of the Senate, Jim, oh, Jim Ferguson. No. Um, I know him a little bit, but the whole tenor of the legislature is more liberal. And I don't know how that's going to play out. Uh, the biggest issues, uh, again, in just a minute, is going to be education. The first bill on the agenda for both the Senate and the House is a bill to use the Maryland Stadium Authority's bonding capacity to go to building schools across the state to try to get the state up to where it needs to be. Uh, because every county, uh, I don't know if Carol, you all are in pretty good shape, but I'm sure you need more schools and renovation, so that's good. The bad part is that we're going to talk about Kerwin, which is a $32 billion problem. Uh, the governor has come out very strongly against it if it doesn't have serious accountability and serious consequences, which it does not at this point. Um, that's going to be a real Donny Brook. Unfortunately, the Democrats have the power down there with a the supermajority to do anything that they want. And uh, it's just going to be interesting to see how much we can, we can do to make it not as bad as it's going to be. Um, anything else? I'll leave it to everybody else. Thank you for having me, and uh, I look forward to questions. Thank you. Good morning. I'll stand up too. And what a great crowd. And thank you all for coming. The, the most unique thing about our county is just who all participates in these events and in working together. You know, whether it's a school board, our school system, our hospital, our business community, our law enforcement, our state's attorney. I mean, that's what makes our, our county so great. And I, I say that all the time because it's 
it's not the, it's not the norm, and I'm just so pleased that that's how we work here in Carroll. Obviously, the biggest issue this year coming up is going to be education funding, which is one of the things in the Constitution that is required of the state of Maryland, and we need to do it well, but we might make sure we have accountability to go with it. Um, I'm not going to speak to that because we have two members of the delegation that are on the actual committee that will uh, look at the legislation and at the funding sources, so I won't talk about it. Um, I, I will say that anyone that says they're for or against Kerwin we don't have a bill to look at yet. We have a report that is very thick, that has a lot of great ideas in it, um, and that's, it's wonderful. And we had this um, 18, 20 years ago with the uh, Thornton Commission. We had the exact same thing, but we did not get the results out of the investment of money that we, that we thought we were going to get. So right now, we don't have a bill to look at to say, here's what we're for or against. So anyone that says we're for or against anything, you really can't say it, but we need to figure out what the accountability measures, what's it going to be, mean for our students. And um, one of the things that I want to do, I serve on the Health and Government Operations Committee, and we need to make sure that we look at funding of the state budget in <coughs> a, a, a more of a holistic point of view, because we have a lot of issues that are really important. Healthcare is huge. Um, every one of us in this room, whether you're a business person, a government employee, anybody, we need access to affordable, quality healthcare. And there are it's boring my committee, some of the things that we, we talk about, the policy issues, but drug uh, costs are a very big deal. You hear it on the uh, national news, we need to work on that. Um, also, just access to care. Uh, hospital, the, the cost of hospital, the cost of um, medical malpractice is going up for hospitals. We just had a huge, huge, um, uh, um, I guess, payout to, well, it's not payout yet, but a, an award to a hospital, Hopkins Hospital, for a birth injury. It's totally unaffordable, just raises hospital costs up. So addressing those kind of issues are really important. Um, the way to pay for the, the Kerwin Commission, there's been lots of discussion. One of them was legalizing marijuana. I, I just think it's an awful thing to uh, talk about that the way to pay for education is to legalize something that is very controversial. I don't see that happening this year. Recreational marijuana I'm talking about, not medical marijuana. Um, we also have a huge problem with mental health and opioid addiction. And in this county, we are doing a very good job to try to address it holistically here in the county, all working together. The people that I just mentioned, um, the school system, the state's attorney's office, the sheriff's department, all of our providers, the hospital, all working here locally um, to, to figure out what we can do here in Carroll County for the opioid addiction. We have a, a huge problem. And it's gone from heroin to cocaine now, laced with fentanyl. And it just keeps changing. So we've got to get, we've got to address the problem, get to the root of the problem, and keep focusing on the opioid ep epidemic. Um, they also have some bills that we passed in previous years that we need to look at the results of. One is the, the paid sick leave policy. It all sounds great. But now that it's implemented, how does it affect your business? How does it affect the healthcare industry when you have to have mandatory um, sick, sick pay, but yet you still have patients in the hospital or patients in an assisted living over a holiday when you, and you have mandatory sick pay and you've got to pay people, but yet you have to take care of folks that are showing up at these facilities? And, and how do you do that and keep costs down and reasonable? So sometimes good ideas, when they're implemented, um, have negative consequences. So trying to follow up on that as well. I also do a lot of tax policy, given my background, I'm an accountant by trade. Um, in, in Maryland, we need to keep talking about our tax policy as we talk about the full budget. Uh, Maryland, as many of you know, is one of the highest tax states in the country. And we also are, have just been degraded to the 50th worst place to retire in the nation. That is not something to be proud of. And we are losing, we're losing a lot of high wealth individuals in our state, and that is not good. So we've got to continue to talk about those types of issues. as when we're talking about raising more taxes or bringing in more revenue, and it, it really becomes about priorities. You know, what are the priorities of the state um, on how we spend our money? Because I don't think we can keep going to the well, because the very same teachers that we want to pay more have to retire someday, and, if, and our police officers and our government employees and our business people. So we've got to not, we don't want to be at the bottom of the pack for the worst place to retire in the nation. So we're, um, we'll continue to put legislation out that at least makes it reasonable and fair. Will it ever pass? I don't know, but it needs to be part of the discussion um, when we're discussing all these other policies. But I want to thank um, Bill Gavin especially. I thank him every year and the legislative committee. We do really depend on, on your expertise and letting us know how these bills affect your business. Whether it's a sick leave policy or anything else, it really gives us something to go and talk about, um, not just anecdotally, but in real life. How did this bill or how will this bill affect you? Or the same with the county. Uh, I don't want to leave out the county and the county commissioners. You know, how does this affect what you do in the county? So um, please keep the lines of communication open. We appreciate it. Thank you.
All right. Happy New Year, everybody. Uh, next, uh, next week, we head back in uh, to Annapolis, which uh, I affectionately refer to as Fantasyland. Um, so starting Wednesday, just hold on to your wallets. OK. Uh, as uh, Delegate uh, Kittleman alluded to, there has been a progressive shift in leadership down there. There's no question about it. Uh, you know, for all those folks, and you know, I was one of those people too that did some hand wringing about the uh, long tenure of uh, the two previous leaders of the respective chambers, you know, <coughs> Mike Bush and Mike Miller, who you know, held those positions of power for a long time. And you know, a lot of folks uh, would, would wanted to see uh, that those positions of power changed up. Uh, sometimes you got to be careful what you wish for, because you just might get it. <laughs> and I have a uh, feeling that uh, this year, in particular, we're going to get it. So uh, those those are the those are the op optimistic chords I want to strike. <laughs> here as we head into the, the, the new year. Um, I serve on the Ways and Means Committee with Delegate Rose. And we deal with education policy amongst other things, like tax policy and uh, election law and gaming. But education, as you would suspect, since we're going to be dealing with the Kerwin Bill, uh, this year consumes a fair amount of our time. And I'm pretty sure that it's going to be pretty much all Kerwin all the time this year. And uh, Delegate uh, Kittleman also alluded to the hefty price tag associated with that piece of legislation. And I have to say that what it all boils down to, it seems to me, is the philosophical dichotomy that we see in Annapolis. Some folks on the other side of the aisle from us in general uh, believe that the solution to every problem is to throw money at it. And this particular piece of legislation doesn't have significant accountability. Last year's bill that came through uh, had an IG, an Inspector General component to it, but it was pretty watered down, to be frank. So in essence, what we want to do here, or what leadership in Annapolis wants to do, is throw money at education with very little in the way of accountability. And oh, don't forget, we've also not figured out how we're going to pay for this thing yet. So the, the Kerwin Commission has been in place since like 2015. Last I checked, it's now 2020. And we still haven't figured out really how we're going to pay for this thing. And I think that's the ultimate tragedy of the Kerwin Commission. And I got to say, uh, I'm a believer that this Kerwin bill is going to be the biggest boondoggle foisted upon the taxpayers of Maryland since the rain tax. So get ready, folks, because here it comes. We're going to go down there and uh, fight the good fight to try to improve that thing so that Hopefully, it does a little more than try to make Maryland education look like Singapore. Uh, that's their objective. Uh, but I'm not real optimistic, given the fact, frankly, uh, that we just don't have the numbers. So that's my rosy outlook <laughs> on the 2020 session. Thank you. So, thank you all. I'm looking forward to questions. God bless. Good morning. Before anybody slits their wrist, I thought I'd get up. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, nice job moving the golf tournament, by the way. I just want to say it's going to be in the cool fall this year, so we won't all be roasting out. Uh, I look forward, to, look forward to that. I was looking at these great events coming up. Um, I, Delegate Shoemaker is correct in pointing out we've really seen a, over the years we've seen a sea change in Annapolis where it's, um, um, even since the time I joined the General Assembly in 2011 in the House, and uh, at that time I thought it was pretty liberal. Uh, <laughs> and it's, uh, what's happening is in the Democratic seats, the safe seats in Maryland, of which there are many safe House and State Senate seats, the primary process has led to more and more left wing, and I'm I'm not trying to be pejorative, I mean, very left-wing people being elected in places like Montgomery and Prince George's County to the point where they have no real reason to compromise. Their only political fear would be losing to a primary opponent who's further left. So that is a challenge um, and because you're trying to get people to understand, hey, we've got to make laws for the whole state, whether it's on tax policy, minimum wage, education. And so that's a challenge for us. The new Senate president is a guy that I actually fi have, have a good relationship on a personal level. He's, he's basically my age. Um, he's actually a year younger, which makes me feel very, um, very unaccomplished. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but he is, he's a family guy, and he, he's a policy wonk, and I mean that as a compliment. Um, however, he is certainly more progressive. Um, he's, he's come and met with a lot of us in our districts. Um, he and I have had a number of, of good conversations since he was chosen. But I am concerned um, there, in both houses that we're going to see uh, things moving further to the left. Uh, and um, in the Senate for many years, Mike Miller, while I certainly had my share of big fights with him <laughs> on policy, he did a really good job of making sure that people heard the minority side of things and that if you raised a really legitimate objection, you had a real chance to at least get a bill amended or, or change. Maybe you don't kill the bill, but you get it amended. And I don't know what's going to happen in that regard moving forward. A couple of policy things that I'll touch upon um, that I think are very important, and I do think they relate to they relate to business uh, and business concerns. Uh, this session, of course, is going to be a lot about Kerwin, and that's going to be covered here by my other colleagues who do a great job in, in covering those issues. Um, crime, crime in Baltimore is out of control, and it's destabilizing our entire region. Um, I just saw, actually, I was just looking at news this morning. Uh, Baltimore County had its most violent and deadly year on record. In a, in a long time, I don't know how long, but in a couple decades at least, over 50 people killed. In Baltimore, they had 357 murders, 331 by handgun, and I would bet, maybe not my next mortgage payment, maybe, I would bet that none of those were legal handguns. They were all illegal handguns. However, there's going to be a push this session again to try to further regulate long guns and come up with a like a licensing scheme. So if you want to go buy a 22 at Walmart or wherever, you're going to have to get a whole background check and get a licensing scheme. That bill was defeated because the two houses couldn't figure it out last year. One house wanted something way more strident. Our Senate version was a little more moderate. I still didn't support it. It was a little more moderate, and they couldn't reconcile. I, I don't think that's going to be as much of an issue this year. I think they're going to find a way to try to push that. I, say, I bring that up. That's not a business issue necessarily, unless you sell firearms. Um, but... Uh, I think it's a, it's a, shows a mindset problem on crime. The other, the other issue is that they don't want what we don't have in places like Baltimore City. We have it in Carroll County, and they have it in Baltimore County, by the way. Uh, they have a very good state's attorney there and, and sheriff but, uh, and law enforcement. But what they, what they don't do in Baltimore City is when you commit a crime, there are not swift and certain accountable actions, that not swift and certain uh, um, outcomes for that, meaning that whether you think somebody should be thrown in jail for 20 years for certain crimes or not, Whatever you're going to do to them, it needs to happen, always be consistent and, and happen. And that's not happening in Baltimore City. And one of the problems even with passing more laws that have stricter sentencing is if the, the prosecutor won't go after the stricter sentencing, then it's harder, even if it's on the books, if they're not charging properly. And we're seeing a big problem with that in the city. And that affects our business community because if Baltimore is unsafe, if the Baltimore region is unsafe, it makes it hard for us to conduct business. Carroll County is very dependent on not just our people going and working in the Baltimore area, which is very important, but we, the port is an important part of Carroll County. Um, commerce downtown in Baltimore uh, is, is very important. And multinational companies are not going to want to locate to the Baltimore region when it's violent and unsafe, which affects our ability to attract uh, companies even to, even to Carroll County, even though we're, we would think of ourselves as out here and it's not part of it. Truth is, it's, it, it can come out here too. So. Um, with, because I don't have a lot of time, I can't get into all the ideas, but there's a number of things we're going to be looking at. Um, my concern is that, again, in the General Assembly, the idea is, well, crime is a result of decades of socioeconomic and 
um, issues. It's like, well, yeah, that's true, but we need to triage some of this like now. Uh, and, and unfortunately, I'm, I'm concerned. I'm hoping that we can have that sort of command focus in my committee, which is judicial proceedings where we deal with these issues. Um, we're going to have a new chairman who's also very progressive. Uh, our chairman, Bobby Zirkin, decided to retire. Um, and he was a more of a moderate Democrat. And so again, it's another situation where the new chairman's gonna be very progressive. So um, I'm concerned about that, although I am optimistic that if we can have the right message and really really be engaged in the process, uh, we can make things happen. Last thing I'll mention, I know I'm already over probably five minutes, but transportation. Um, you may or may not be paying attention to this, um, and it's okay if you're not, but I wanna clue you in. There's a big battle right now at the Board of Public Works, which is the governor, comptroller, and state treasurer over the plan to widen and modernize 270, the, the, um, the American Legion Bridge, and 495. And you may say, well, I don't ever go to 495, and believe me, I, I'd like to not ever have to go to 495 either. Um, but the issue is, um, and actually it's the comptroller right now that's sort of holding it up after originally being for the idea of doing this expanding and widening. Um, and there are a lot of excuses being used. It's basically because about several hundred very loud activists in Silver Spring and Tacoma Park show up at rallies and show up at town meetings and scream and yell about it because they don't really believe in expanding road capacity, period. It's always like, well, we need more mass transit. Well, we got lots of mass transit in the D.C. area, and we're going to have the Purple Line, but you still got to fix that American Legion Bridge. Uh, the reason that's important even for Carroll is, number one, the 270 corridor is important for our county and for business. I imagine if you have a business here in the county, 270 is important to you, um, or it, it, it could be anyway. But also what it says about our policies going forward is that if, the, if, if, if even someone who's been more of a moderate sort of deal maker like Peter Francho is not willing to push forward on expanding our road capacity, what it says about our ability to get things that our county needs, such as eventually the widening of 32 and other important transportation priorities, it's, it's not, that's not good. So um, I think it's, that's a really important business issue, transportation, that what will happen this session is that I think there's gonna be a push from the DC area, very liberal Democrats, to try to uh, spike that project legislatively. Um, and last year they sort of tried, but it was scuttled. This year I'm concerned. And what that says about when we try to get road capacity for things that we need up here. So if I can encourage you to make your voice heard, uh, if you want to look into that issue, if, if that strikes a chord with you, it may be worth you sending a comment to your comptroller who you elect, Peter Francho. Um, obviously, we're all very supportive of, of transportation parties. I don't think mass transit is a bad thing, but right now, over historically, until this governor, most of the transportation trust fund, our gas tax dollars, was going towards mass transit, and it was not going. Martin O'Malley didn't do anything on road capacity for eight years, basically. They did start widening 695 after the gas tax increase. Other than that, very little on road capacity. And, and nothing outside the I-95 corridor. That's a huge problem for our business community and for jobs and, and also for people to get home to be with their families. So I know I went like 10 minutes. I apologize. But I think those are two big issues. You'll hear a lot about education, which is really important also. But crime and transportation are two other big issues this session. Good morning, everybody. It's really wonderful to be here. It's wonderful the timing of this event because we get to be with such wonderful friends and, and community leaders who are friendly and agree with us before we head down, uh, head down south a bit and start to get beat up a little. Um, as uh, Delegate Shoemaker mentioned, uh, we both serve on Ways and Means, and so we deal with education, election law, gaming, and taxes. Um, I'll touch a little bit on Kerwin. Uh, you know, we've been, I feel like Haven and I have really been all Kerwin all the time for several, I think we're on our third full year of briefings and discussions, and Trent as well, being on the money side uh, on appropriations. And, um, you know, it's, it's really been frustrating. I think there's a lot, you know, not to be completely negative, I think there are some good ideas and good things in some of the object, objectives of Kerwin. Um, I think it's one thing that we've been working on, uh, I know I've been working on for <coughs> several years since I've been in office, is you know workforce development, classes, and educational opportunities that provide kids real world experience and opportunities to learn about many different in industries from the STEM fields to the trades. And I know uh, Delegate Shoemaker's had the Ag Education Bill year after year. And you know this has such a big price tag, and there are so many 
really good things we could do in education that would not cost a lot. Um, so I'm hoping, and I'm I, what I would really like to see is maybe you know, like we said, we have don't actually have a bill, but we have a big giant report, and we will be briefed on that, and we will be discussing that. And I would like to see it, you know, really broken into some different bills that really focus on things that make sense, rather than this one big, over-encompassing, very costly uh, bill. You know, the main three things I'm looking for is transparency, accountability, and flexibility. You know, what works for Carroll and what we do well here may not work for Baltimore City or Montgomery County. We're very different communities. So that's some of the things that I'm going to, you know, advocate for. I keep hitting that, sorry. And, um, you know, continue to have those conversations. Um, I also serve on the gaming subcommittee, so I'll just touch on another big dollar item that will be coming down the pike uh, dealing with Preakness and what are we going to do about Pimlico. And we've, you know, we've had some meetings with um, some of our folks and the Horsemen's Association. <laughs> What we are hearing so far is that everybody is at the table and singing kumbaya, and they found a way to pay for this that will not cost the taxpayers additional money. Um, so I'm hopeful and I'm willing to listen, but again, we don't have an actual bill. And we've been told before that everybody's come to the table and we're singing kumbaya, kumbaya and then it, it goes away. So it's something that will, will be definitely front and center. I think our committee is going to have a lot of the hot button issues this year. And of course, we never know what else will pop up. So that's one thing, as Trent said, you know, it, we're not quite sure how this, this session is going to look. I was chatting with someone in HR down in Annapolis yesterday, and she, joke, she joked and she says, you guys need to put on your seatbelts because this is going to be a wild year. Uh, we have a lot of changing, uh, changing faces that are still to come with certain appointments that have happened. So now there's other seats that will be filled. And as you mentioned, the trend has been for filling these seats with people who are more and more and more to the left. Um, so it's going to be very interesting. Another little um, item that is of concern to me, and we don't know quite how it's going to be, um, there's a lot of different subcommittee chairs. And how the bills work and what happens, every bill gets a hearing, then it, it goes to a subcommittee. Well, the subcommittee chairs have a lot of power because they can just not vote on a bill, not bring it to the subcommittee, and it could just disappear. So some of these new subcommittee chairs, it's hard to say how they are going to be because we have a lot of different leadership. And you know, we knew basically how most people thought and worked before. Now it's all going to be very, very different. Um, as uh, we were actually talking at the table, you know, um, both leadership on both sides of the house are much more Baltimore centric. So it's not going to be as much, um, you know, Montgomery County and and you know those areas. Uh, Senate President Miller, while we often did not agree, was from a more rural part of the of the state and would sometimes think about how things affect the rural community, <coughs> and we've kind of lost that. So that that's of concern to me as well. Um, and then uh, I just want to say I'm, I'm very tickled. You know, I thank you in the Legislative Committee so much. And with my other work in, in my regular life in HR, it's, it's nice to have a, a, a SHRM member. And you know, so much of what happens with the bills that we pass, especially affecting the business community, get implemented in HR. So like Susan mentioned, it sounds like a good idea, paid sick leave or increasing the minimum wage and things like of that nature, but the actual implementation can be very challenging and very difficult. And that sometimes is just not heard or listened to as we're trying to explain that to our friends on the other side of the aisle, who I think are well-intentioned, but the actual effect on, the biz on our businesses is very, um, sometimes that's not heard or, or listened to. Um, I really appreciate the Legislative Committee. I really appreciate your letters. And as we see what is coming down the pike, I encourage you to share your specific to your industry, your business, how something might negatively affect you so that we can advocate and use that as we're trying to make those arguments. Those are invaluable to us. And again, thank you so much for having us here. It's going to be uh, a wild 90 days, I think. Um, but we appreciate you so much. I know I certainly do. I know all of our doors are open. And we're always happy to hear from you. So thank you. echo something Delegate Rose said is that, you know, we on the Legislative Committee spend a great deal of time reviewing bills from <clears throat> any number of disciplines, as, as you all know, that everything that comes up. And we discuss them, we analyze them, we decide whether, you know, the, the Chamber will support or 
oppose. And that's great. We write our letters. You know, the delegation gets those copies. The, the chair people down in Annapolis get those letters. But what's even more, I think, to some degree important is for our delegation and the folks in Annapolis to hear directly from you exactly how those bills are going to affect your business in, you know, when the rubber meets the road in real life. So when they hear that actual information, that's going to have a lot more impact or additional impact than just somebody getting up and saying, oh, no, we don't like that, or oh, yes, we love that. So the more everybody hears from you, the better I think that's going to be. So now we're going we're gonna to open it up to some questions. Um, we have some time for that. So does anybody have a question for the delegation? <coughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, wait. <laughs> I don't know how many of you have seen Project Baltimore, which is on Fox News, uh, and their uh, attempts to get information from Baltimore City uh, Board of Education. And it has, I mean, they had to take them to court. I think it was like $140,000 was spent. And, and, and Baltimore City Schools lost that suit and took their good old time in giving the reporter the information requested. You know, I think the big problem down there is where does the money go? And I understand that we've got had schools down there without air conditioning or without heat, and they turn money back to the state, as I remember, uh, millions. And it doesn't make any sense. Somebody's got to be overseeing this because evidently they can't handle it themselves and with Kerr we're just going to be throwing a lot more money at them and and not really I'm, I'm really concerned about the outcome of where that money is spent so I hope that you all will really push uh, some sort of accountability in this Kerwin bill because otherwise it's going to be another boondoggle like the previous one was thank you that, that's my table talking. <laughs> we were um, discussing Baltimore City, and I jump in because although I represent the two best school systems in the entire state, I have been focused on Baltimore City ever since I was on the Judiciary Committee because everything in Baltimore City does not work. And I have researched the whole history of Baltimore City's efforts to have a school system that can actually teach the children, and it, it's very, very depressing. Um, there is a, a, a Court of Appeals opinion that goes through the efforts that were made specifically to get Baltimore City to improve during the Thornton years, and you can see item by item, this committee said do this, and this committee, every single time what happens is they don't do it. And they turn around and say, we need more money. I, I don't know what happens to the money, just as a, but there has to be. My, my response to that in my own mind was, the only thing, if you're in a business, when you get this bad, you need to go into receivership. I didn't realize that you actually could do that with, uh, with um, you know, cities and government agencies. And Governor Ehrlich tried to do something like that while he, when he was governor. But with the current makeup of the legislate, legis, <laughs> the General Assembly, um, I'm not sure that we could, could do that. I, I don't have an answer to it. I just, Project Baltimore has been phenomenal. The things that they have shown over and over and over again, not just with education, but it's, it's you know, it would be nice if we had a really nice city uh, and problems go back way to the beginning, and I'll shut up now because I could talk about that for too long. <laughs> Any other questions? If, if and when Kerwin passes, how are the how is the delegation and the commissioners going to pay for the share that we as taxpayers here have to pay for, not the state funding? I can answer that. Um, right now, the way the way it's laid out, Carroll County will not have to pay any more money from Carroll County. 
the way it's proposed right now. And that's because Carroll County and many of the other counties have gone above maintenance of effort for the last number of years. And so they, and Howard County, a lot of the counties have actually paid more than they were required to, which is good. Um, there are some jurisdictions that did not, did not put the resources in that they were supposed to, which is um, the three big ones, Baltimore, Montgomery, and Prince George's. So their, their portion is going to be hundreds of millions of dollars, 300 and some million, I think, from Montgomery and Baltimore. It's large numbers. I don't see that happening. There's no way they can come up with those extra dollars. So that's when people say, here's the proposal, and we're off the hook in Carroll County. We're just going to receive money. That's just what, where we are today. I don't see it ending up like that. So we need to be cautious of what the proposal is, what, what actually comes out of it, and where do we end up. And keep in mind, the state is going to be putting in billions of dollars. That money has to come from somewhere. It's going to come from someone's pocketbook somewhere. So that's what we have to you know, worry about. And again, if you had accountability to go with it, maybe we'd be worth the investment. We, we haven't had that. And I was listening on the way down on the radio, <clears throat> I think it was Brandon Scott, who's running for mayor, was saying that we've chronically underfunded schools for many, many years, and we've got to get caught up. And that is just factually incorrect, but they have themselves convinced of that. Um, we are one of the highest, Baltimore City is one, it's the third highest funded school system in the country for a school system that size. And keep in mind, the funding formula is for Baltimore City, we pay for many things outside of the formula, like transportation costs. In Carroll County, we pay for our own transportation within our funding formula. In Baltimore City, we pay for that. The state of Maryland pays for their transportation, their regular transportation, over and above the funding formula. We're one of the few states in the country that pay for school construction. Most country, I mean, most um, states, the individual school boards pay for their own school construction or their own, their own county. So when you really look and compare apples and, and apples, we really pay way more to our counties than even is the way that we look at it. So um, your, the, the quick answer to your question is right now, Carroll County looks like they will not have to pay any additional on the county side. But somewhere on the state side, that revenue has to come from somewhere. I think it's an important. It's important to note too that what Delegate Krebs is talking about is one of the reasons that it is important for us. You know, so if you hear us, when you hear, we're very, we take a dim view of a lot of this, but at the same time, we're going to have to all be very, we're all going to be very engaged in the discussion process, and certainly Delegate Rosen Duncan Schumacher in the committee process on the House side, um, because you know how this thing gets written, we, we can't just go down there and cross our arms and not do anything or stay home. I mean, that's why it's important because there's going to be a fight. Um, Baltimore City, but speaking of underfunded schools, they've underfunded their own schools. That's what's happened over the years, over many years. Uh, they've, they've underfunded their schools, which is why they're, that's why the new formula says that's being proposed says they got to pay more. But that's what we're going to really try to engage uh, as a delegation in the process because if we just sit there and don't engage, you know, they'll be like, hey, you know, you guys got some money lying around. So we, it's definitely going to be, I mean, it's definitely a, a, going to be a big, that's why we're saying it's such an important issue, not just because it's being talked about a lot, but because it will consume, even if we're not on a committee, we're going to be spending a lot of time watching it. And, and I'll just add, um, and I know we're, we're really kind of stuck on education, but that really is kind of sucking the air out of the room in Annapolis for the conversations this year. But, you know, um, when we talk about, you know, Baltimore City and the cost, you know, we, we focus a lot on the cost, but we forget sometimes, you know, the kids that are sitting in those seats that are not getting a quality education. And we did get the IG bill passed, and the governor is trying to put some additional accountability into these schools. So if you're in an underperforming school in this new STAR system for two years in a row, he is proposing that there is a mechanism for the locals to come in and take control of those schools and try to get it fixed. Now, that's something that we've always seen a pushback on because we are a very state down, top down, uh, in, you know, regulation of education. And that's where I go back to, you know, my three points on Kerwin is the flexibility and the accountability. <coughs> we need that flexibility. Baltimore City needs that flexibility, but within a smaller entity that where there can be true transparency where you have parents and the community involved so that these kids are not stuck. We have a lot of mechanisms in Baltimore City uh, and other areas where if, if a kid is stuck in a, in a a, a bad school that isn't, they have, don't have the opportunity to learn. We had boost money available. We still have some. Uh, and that would give a child who really does maybe have an engaged family, a family unit that would like to get that child a, a decent education, give them money to go to, you know, a charter school or a private school. And we see constant pushback on that. We have since the day we've, uh, since I've been down there and I think forever, um, you know, these are flexible options that should be available to parents so that they 
they are able to, to do that. And so we have this big giant Kerwin bill that has all of these things that are supposedly going to fix everything with this big price tag, yet we have tools in the tool box today that we're not using. And so that's, oh, that's just been a big frustration um, down there. And just to uh, highlight the point that uh, Senator Reedy raised about the, the locals uh, not bearing their share of the load in Baltimore City in particular, you know, you got to contrast what we've done out here in Carroll County. Uh, here in uh, our county, you know, about 55% of the school system budget comes from local government, county commissioners. And even, even when I was uh, county commissioner on that crazy board that I served on, we funded uh, education over maintenance of effort. We did that even then. And the Carroll County commissioners for years have done a great job at doing that. In Baltimore City, on the other hand, only about 15% of their education budget comes from the locals. The rest comes from all of us across the state. So uh, the folks in Baltimore City, if you know, they want more money, I, you know, from my perspective, they need to put their money where their mouth is. Let me just piggyback on what uh, um, Delegate Rose said about options. One of the things I think that makes us so um, cynical about being able to correct anything is that not only do the, um, uh, the other side of the aisle not want to implement any options, anything out of the box, but they're even more aggressive than that. In the Appropriations Committee, the chair made an effort to eliminate all funding for boost for which is a mine, very little piece of the voucher system fortunately that didn't go through with the budget but that's what they're trying to do and in the bill that we talked about when we were here a year or two ago protect our schools the part that bothered me the most was when they talked about what do you do when you have a bad school uh, not only did they not give anything out of the box they said you may not do this, and they listed charter schools and districts, six specific items that are out of the box that do work. DC schools used to be, you know, have a reputation. They are now well above Baltimore schools because they had a, well, I won't go into that, but they have 50% of their schools are charter. And that's, that's perfect. You're not trying to replace public schools. What has happened is the public schools now facing a little bit of competition, have improved themselves. But we're not being allowed to do any of that because of the nature of our legislature. I think I saw another question someplace. Oh, okay. is, is there any actual hope for redistricting? Because none of this gets any better until there are competitive districts and people actually have to come to the table and compromise. So is there any actual hope? Because right now, is probably our last hope. I, I'll give you my, I, I could give you 12 minutes on redistricting or two minutes. Um, the governor will put, yeah, yeah, thanks Mike, two minutes. <laughs> we'll do the class, we'll do the sociology, uh, political science uh, 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 auditing course later. Um, I, I, I've spent a lot of time doing this. I've done a lot of political stuff in my other job and um, so looked at districts for years and Delhi Krebs and I actually fought, we were part of an effort fighting the last map um, trying to get fairer districts. And actually the state legislative districts in some ways are more important than congressional for the governing of the state. The focus is on how terrible the gerrymandered congressional districts are and they are awful. But the, on, that part, on congressional, the governor will submit a map. We'll get the census numbers back in 2021 from the 2020 census. There will be a process where the governor will appoint a board. O'Malley did this too. It was mostly for show, but he did it. He will appoint a commission to go around the state and take public input. The governor will put forward a congressional map as a bill in the 2022 session, he will also put forward a state legislative map in the 2022 session. The congressional map um, can be like they can the general assembly can pass its own and then override the governor's veto if he vetoes it. The governor will probably have to try to figure out how we can get a fair congressional map. Um, hopefully, a lot of shame will be involved in trying to get maps that look fair. On the state legislative, he also introduces a bill at the beginning of 2022. Um, 
and his map i think will be fair in fact it could even include maybe single member delegate districts which would be a more fair way to do delegate districts i'm not putting words in anybody's mouth i just think that could happen if the general assembly doesn't take action within 45 days that map becomes law however if they do try to pass their own map you get into that whole veto battle again but that could eventually go to court uh, and, and the governor, by, by 2022, the, the State Court of Appeals will be made up pretty much entirely of Hogan appointees, not because that should be partisan, but just because there'll be fair-minded people that will look at a map and say, that's where the state legislative map would go. So it could end up where either deals are cut and we get a pretty fair map, maybe not everything we want, but fairer, or it could end up possibly being a battle and in court. The congressional map is a little tougher to predict because that would those court cases go through federal court. Um, but so it's up in the air. We're in a better position because we have a, a Governor Hogan than if we didn't, um, for sure. Um, but it's you're right. That's a huge issue. It's actually one of the biggest political policy political issues we face to get to for the future of the state. So I'm, I'm glad you asked about it. But that's like a thumbnail sketch. It, it, it's complicated, but it is important. Uh, I, I appreciate everything you've been sharing. Um, I think you're representing us very well in our community. One thing that you haven't spoken of is our veterans. And uh, are there any programs that you're going to see down in Annapolis that are going to uh, increase our benefits for our veterans? I know Governor Hogan uh, and the team has been pushing that, but it's been very slow in coming over the years. Uh, you know here in our community, it's not about flagpoles and dedications, but it's actually about transportation and getting our veterans the services that they deserve. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? So. <clears throat> this, uh, this year, I, believe it or not, am the president of the Women's Caucus in the legislature. We try our best to be bipartisan. And in doing so, one of the things that we did last year and are going to do again this year it's not legislation, which I think is a good thing, but we focus on women veterans. Uh, they have been largely a forgotten group, and uh, the unfortunately, last year when we had the group in, it was in the middle of our toughest time, so we all didn't get to participate, but we will again. We listen to what they say. Some bills have been crafted for things that um, that we find that they need and they have passed. Uh, that probably doesn't answer your question completely, but we are focusing uh, at least our efforts from the female, so female side of it uh, on, on women veterans. And let, me, let me, oh, go ahead. you want me to? Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, and I appreciate the question, and it certainly is extremely important, and we've had several bills through our committee um, year after year about making Maryland, uh, not just for women but who are very important, but also um, all of our veterans, to try to keep them in the state. They're a wonderful part of our community and we want to keep them there. Um, I haven't heard of any legislation thus far. Uh, we generally get a nice briefing from the Veterans um, Administration down in Annapolis when we get there, and I will be very happy to see what they put forth this year. Uh, I know we've, we've all been very supportive of that and would continue to do so and open to uh, any ideas or any specific concerns that you may have that we could bring down there. So thank you for the question, and it's extremely important. Let me just add that, uh, you know, I, I serve on the Veterans Caucus down there, and I can tell you that Maryland is, at least incrementally, a little better for uh, retirement benefits for veterans than it was, say, five years ago when Larry Hogan took office. Uh, we've raised the uh, exemption uh, on uh, military pension benefits from 5,000. I think then it went up to 10. I think now it's up to 15. Uh, but any additional tax relief above and beyond that is going to be a particularly hard sell this year because yeah, because of Kerwin, frankly, frankly, and the fact that the legislature is going to want to fund that uh, that massive, massive project. So, uh, you know, it'll be a tough sell getting any tax relief this year, I think. 
I want to just mention a couple of policy things that we've done over the years. It's not just always about tax relief when they when they retire. When our veterans come home from service, they need jobs. And we had a lot of obstacles to employment with licensing. And over the years, we have really reduced those. The, we've tried to make it more seamless for our veterans who actually have one of the job experience, especially in the medical field. You know, on the battlefield, they're trained. They're trained medics. They come here, and they have to go through this process that is long and arduous when they already have more experience than many people who finish school. So we have really tried to streamline the licensing process, and we also um, have a vet veteran set aside for small business, um, so we've tried to do that. And many, many companies, that's where businesses step up, are trying to prioritize hiring veterans. So those types of things help our veterans before they get to retirement, and hopefully they, uh, that will be necess that's necessary. And if I could just add one thing, as you as we are all discussing, it makes you think of other things. You know, one thing to keep an eye on, um, and I don't know if anyone in this room is a benefit of any sp specific tax credit, but that's something that they've already said they're going to be coming in and reviewing because they're looking for every dollar they can get for funding Kerwin. So if there's something that you are getting a benefit for currently as, as some grant money or a tax credit, that's something to keep an eye on, and we certainly will be keeping an eye on that. Okay, so um, I think we're kind of out of time, and Mike has a few more comments, so thank you for your patience and uh, attention, and I'll turn it back to Mike. Thank you. Thank you, thank you to our delegation. How about a round of applause for them? You know, we're, we're very lucky here in Carroll as a business community to have such a pro-business delegation. I mean, these guys are, they're awesome, and they're fighting a battle that's, that's hard. You know, I can tell you, when one of, the, one of the stats we gave in the beginning was only 43% of the letters that we wrote were the bills decided the way that we wanted them decided. I mean, that's, that shows it's a state that has some fundamental challenges as far as business goes. But I want to thank you guys. And we always hope to leave you wanting more from them. I mean, we could have gone on for a longer time. So that's why make sure you get some phone numbers, make sure you get addresses, emails, meet them, take them out for lunch, talk to them about concerns that you have. So thank you. The lunch has to be less than $25, that's though. Right. <laughs> that's the rule. That's good. I like that. Um, Dana, thank you so much. Nice job. Nice job as our chair. Now the real work starts in a couple of weeks. I'm serious. We do need help on our legislative committee. You know, we've lost a few folks. We could have you back. You don't have to come every week. We start... Uh, Monday, January 20th, we go for like eight weeks. If you show up at half of them but bring good information, that's great. We'd love to have you on there. Dennis, I want to thank you for, uh, for doing the intro, and I want to make just one comment, okay? Make sure that your law friends that, you know, we going to work with you understand that I'm going to learn to love Hoffman, Comfort, Offit, <laughs> Scott, and Halstead as a name. A great firm and an amazing name. Thank you so much. Thank you. I've made jokes before and it comes back to haunt me. It's like, I wanna make sure I clarify that. Peggy Soper, wherever you are, Peggy, where's Peggy? Thank Peggy, she's out in the hallway, she does a great job at this. Somebody else who doesn't get enough recognition, Ryan Cook, are you here, Ryan? Where, where's Ryan? He didn't already leave, did he? Okay, Ryan, stand up for a second. Ryan started with us, stay, stay standing. You went to Winter's Mill, right? And you started as an intern on our legislative committee, was it four years ago? So 17, 18, 19, we're well, going into 20, but it it'll be four. And he went to college, and now he still works on the committee. He, he, he dials into the calls, and he helps us with the letter. He's, he's amazing. Another round of applause for him. And obviously, without our sponsors, we don't have events like this. So BGE, Com, Comcast, thank you. Thank you. How about a round of applause for them? And the Community Media Center, these people are our friends to the entire community. They film a lot of our events. They do a great job. Uh, this will be shown on channel 19. Channel 19. Right? Yep, and you'll see links on our website and their website. So how about a round of applause for them? This is where you can get a clap. And how about the hospital, right? They stepped up big as our sponsor for this year, and they gave us this place and some amazing food. So we're hoping to come back here next year, same time, same place. So make sure you write that in there. You guys will sponsor again. Thank you so much to the hospital. All right, there's some little placards on your table with upcoming events. I can tell you January 14th is our state of the county where all of our commissioners come, and they're going to tell you what's going on here in Carroll. There'll be time for Q&A. 
February will be our county budget luncheon. That's going to be at the Best Western every year. That's a great event. Ted uh, Zaleski comes and talks about where the money's going. Uh, March is Outstanding Teacher Awards. That's a great event, too. If you've, how many people, by a show of hands, have ever gone to that event? Okay, so a lot of you have and some of you haven't. If you ever want to, if you're ever kind of feeling down and you kind of want to feel good, go to that event. It is a great event. We honored over 500 educators last year. Uh, we have like, I think over 700 folks who come. It costs five bucks though, so it might make, we, we should, we should charge, charge more for that, I think. But no, it's, it's just going to cost you five bucks. Please come to that. April is our annual uh, Drug and Violence Awareness Expo. That is a great event we do. We had 2,500 students from the different eighth grades all throughout Carroll come to that. Uh, it's a full day, I forget the day, but it's on our website. April 15th, I'd like to invite our delegation to, to take out your cell phones and write down, April 15th at noontime will be our legislative wrap up. That's a Wednesday and we'll have that at McDaniel. So you guys should all come and you can come and tell us how things were just amazingly surprising and you got everything that you wanted. <laughs> so thank you, thank you. May is our annual public safety awards and August will be the Carol Biz Challenge. That's our ninth year. In fact, we're opening up for applications February 13th for the ninth annual Carol Biz Challenge. If you know any entrepreneurs, please let them know. We're also taking applications for next year's Leadership Carol class. If you've ever wanted to go to that, get an application in. Every year I get about five or six people who apply too late and I either let them in and I shouldn't or they have to wait till the next year. So please get your application in. We're going to Italy and the Amalfi Coast October of this year. And uh, we're also accepting applications through the end of the day today uh, for a community engagement manager that we're looking to hire at the chamber. So if you, you know, if, uh, you know anybody, they can go online and they can apply. And that's pretty much it. Did I miss any announcements? I think we're right on schedule. Thank everybody for coming so, so much. The meeting's adjourned. Happy New Year, okay? Thank, thank you. <laughs>